Introducing Andy Ruiz Jr. You looked at Andy and you thought, he doesn't look like what a heavyweight is supposed to look like. But when you saw his skills in the ring, you knew, wow, this kid can fight. Ruiz is out firing. For a big guy, he has really fast counters. Ruiz comes to fire back. And now a barrage. And Sam's in trouble. And down he goes. My whole life, everybody was judging me the way that I looked. I didn't give up. And I think that's what took me this far. That's it. He says that's it. And Andy Ruiz has shocked the world. Becoming the first Mexican heavyweight champion of the world, it was, it was amazing. He did what most people can't do. He knocked out the heavyweight champion of the world with all the belts. And then he threw it away. But Andy Ruiz had to recover from immense and sudden success. And it turns out that can be difficult. This fight is important because now I'm focused and I'm gonna do the things right. My name is Cristobal Arriola. They call me the nightmare. Chris Arriola is the prototypical Mexican warrior. Come forward, take three punches to land one. I'm coming, I keep coming. No matter what fight it is, I ain't scared. I want to be remembered. He's had three opportunities to compete for the heavyweight championship of the world. He's come up short, but Chris Ariola still wants a chance to become a heavyweight champion, and he's hungry to still get it at 40 years old. And this one is over, Chris Ariola. I'm the guy that's gonna keep coming. I'm gonna come out with, with the victory. I learned the lesson of defeat, and I promise you, when I become a two-time Mexican heavyweight champion of the world, I'm not gonna take it for granted. In Southern California, former heavyweight champion Andy Ruiz Jr. is training for his May 1st pay-per-view fight with longtime heavyweight contender Chris Ariola. It's Ruiz's first fight since he lost his heavyweight title to Anthony Joshua in 2019. He's now under the guidance of one of the sport's best trainers in Eddie Reynoso, also trainer of pound-for-pound -pound king Saul Canelo Alvarez. After my defeat in Saudi Arabia against Anthony Joshua, I messaged Canelo and I told him, hey man, like, you think you could help me? I want to be a part of the team. I want to change. I want to, I want to become a heavyweight Canelo, you know, someone that's disciplined, someone that's focused and, you know, wants to conquer and do a legacy in boxing. And, and he said, all right, um, let me talk to Eddie, let's see what, what we could do. And what do you know, he hits me back up the next day and we had a little meeting and that's when they welcomed me in. Trabajar fuerte, creo que está trabajando bastante fuerte en lo físico, en lo técnico. Eh, yo no sé cómo trabajaba en otros campamentos, la verdad lo ignoro, pero eh, para este campamento está trabajando muy fuerte y los resultados están viendo en, en su físico. Ruiz started boxing at the age of six and turned pro in 2009, but was often judged by his appearance rather than his skill. My whole life, everybody was judging me the way that I looked because I was always this chubby little kid. Once they saw me, they're like, oh, you know what, that kid's gonna lose. He's not gonna make it far. He don't take it serious, but I just kept going. I didn't give up. And I think that's what took me this far. Look at Andy Ruiz's body. He doesn't look like your prototypical boxer. He looks like a guy getting off the couch. But he doesn't hit like a guy getting off the couch. He's got hand speed, he's got power, he's got movement for a big guy. And he's one of the most interesting and explosive fighters in the heavyweight division. Andy Ruiz is known as the Destroyer. It's a nickname that he had rising the ranks when he was knocking guys out. Turned more of into a, a technician, but that doesn't sound as cool as being the destroyer. 
They gave me the nickname Destroyer because I was always destroying stuff. Actually, this was way back. I was like four years old. I guess it stayed. I got stuck with, with the name Destroyer. Andy Ruiz is your typical Mexican fighter in many ways. He's got that, that come forward, aggressive style. A lot of power, very quick hands. For a guy that big, probably some of the quickest hands in the heavyweight division. This kid became a must-see attraction in boxing, and you knew sooner or later he was gonna get a big opportunity in the heavyweight division. December of 2016, Andy Ruiz finally gets his opportunity to challenge for a vacant heavyweight title, but he has to travel all the way to Auckland, New Zealand to face Joseph Parker, who calls New Zealand home. You know, they gave me an opportunity to fight for the WBO heavyweight champion of the world, and that was my dream, you know? Joseph Parker was 24 years old at the time, 21 and 0. So this was the battle of two hungry, young, undefeated fighters. This was a very anticipated matchup in the heavyweight division. Kind of a chess match going back and forth. Andy Ruiz trying to uh, always find his way to come forward and get in on the inside. Joseph Parker trying to keep him at a distance. Andy. Uh, started out to really, really good. Parker had his flows in there. He was light on his feet, started using his jab a lot. Ruiz came out consistent. Uh, he held the slight edge and total connects over the first six rounds, but that's when Parker took over in the second half of the fight, and only by the slimmest of margins. But Parker started to outwork Ruiz a little bit. Ruiz maybe slowed down a bit, and Parker maybe found that extra motivation, that extra energy needed, maybe because he was fighting in, in his hometown and the fans were going crazy for him. But it was starting to slip away a little bit from Andy Ruiz in, in those later rounds. Andy Ruiz has an amazing chin, which is a useful tool, especially in the heavyweight division. And that was on full display on this night. Joseph Parker is not necessarily known as a knockout artist, but he absolutely has power. And Andy Ruiz was taking Joseph Parker's hardest shots and walking right through them. That's what makes Andy Ruiz special. It was so close, in fact, the fight that you had two judges who, by the end of it, had called it 115 to 113, and one judge 114, 114. So definitely a contentious decision in terms of how that one played out. Obviously, the, the biggest night of Parker's life, you know, he becomes the first New Zealander to be heavyweight champion, but immense disappointment on Andy Ruiz Jr.'s part. You know, he, he was vying to be great, vying to, to make history. He suffers his first career loss. I personally think that I lost the fight because I knew that I could have done better and I didn't do the things that I was supposed to do. So it was his shine, but I feel like I got the upper hand after that. Even though Andy Ruiz lost this fight, in a way, he won the night or at least announced his presence in the heavyweight division. We were now aware of Andy Ruiz and we've seen him tested against a top fighter and he held his own. And some people could even argue that he won this fight. And if you're Andy Ruiz, yeah, you lost the fight, you lost your first world title fight, but it's nothing to be ashamed of. You keep your head held high. There's no reason why, if you're Andy Ruiz, you don't think you can get another shot. Chris the Nightmare Ariola is busy preparing for his May 1st pay-per-view clash with former heavyweight champion Andy Ruiz Jr. Ariola has a history with Ruiz. Their May 1st bout won't be the first time they have shared a ring together. Uh, we sparred when I was 25, 26 years old. He was 17 years old. I remember seeing him sparring with this guy. First of all, don't judge a book by his cover because he was fat, short, and I'm like, oh, this guy, whatever. Whatever, I guess I'll get in the ring with him. Holy this guy had the fastest hands that I've sparred with as a heavyweight. And then it got a little heated, and actually it was a very good uh, sparring, sparring session, and uh, I knew eventually I was gonna have to deal with him. Alongside his trainer, Joe Goosen, Ariola readies for what could be his last run at the heavyweight elite. Throughout his career, he's been one of the sport's most exciting fighters, and his love for boxing was nurtured growing up in Los Angeles. You know, boxing culture 
Southern California is a big thing because it's a Hispanic-driven sport. And we have, I guess you could call another Mexico out here in Los Angeles, California, you know. And the thing about growing up in Los Angeles, I started boxing at the age of seven. My dad was a boxing trainer. And uh, I begged him to take me to the gym. He finally gave in and took me to the gym when I was seven years old. He comes from Mexican descent, and he was seen for the longest time as the best hope for a Mexican-American heavyweight champion. Chris Ariola calls himself the Nightmare, and that's a good nickname for him because when you fight him, it is a nightmare. He's going to give you hell in that ring. I'm a relentless fighter that keeps coming. You know, If you hit me once, I'm going to try to hit you two, three times, and I'm going to keep coming. You know, um, Just bite down on that mouthpiece, and if you get punched, make sure you don't get knocked out. Chris Ariola always wanted to become the first Mexican-American heavyweight champion. Well, he got his opportunity in September of 2009 against Vitaly Klitschko. I think for Chris Ariola, the opportunity to fight Vitaly Klitschko was his big break in boxing. He was a fighter that had a lot of us interested in who he was and what he could do. He was undefeated. He was an all-action fighter. And when you look at Vitaly Klitschko, he's six foot seven. He's a very large man. He has an absolutely iron chin. This was one of the hardest tests in boxing, but Chris Ariola finally had his elusive heavyweight title opportunity. My mindset when I fought Klitschko was, don't get knocked out. I had it in me, in my mind, I kept watching the Rocky fight. And all he wanted to go was to go to the distance. From the very beginning of the fight, Ariola did what he did most fights, and that was go forward to get on, on the inside this time with Klitschko. Chris kept on coming forward, kept on trying to find opportunities, but it was difficult on the end of a, a long jab from Klitschko. One thing that I learned is that I could take a punch, because he hit me with a couple right hands, and I'm like, holy. He lit, I felt like he was trying to hit the guy behind me. And there was no one behind me. He was trying to go through my head. This was a dominating performance by Vitaly Klitschko. And eventually the referee stopped the fight after round 10. It was obvious that Chris Ariola was taking way too much punishment. And after this fight, you could see the emotions pouring out of Chris Ariola, crying in the post-fight interview. And he said all he wanted to do was to win, to win a title to be the first Mexican ever to be a heavyweight champion. And he didn't get that, and I felt his pain. I cried because I didn't go the distance. I felt like the carpet was pulled underneath me, and then the fight's over. I'm like, wait, what? I still have two more rounds to go. And um, yeah, it was, it was a tough fight. It was a great fight that uh, I definitely learned a lot about myself on that fight. It's a rare off day for Andy Ruiz Jr. And on this day, he and his team have taken to the high seas for a little r and &R. It's my day off, it's Saturday, so I think it's a, it's a good time to go fishing. Andy caught one. Oh, woo! AJ got the first fish. <laughs> That's my first good fish. Good job. Uh -oh. I hope I catch another fish. Good one. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Check that out. Dad. Uh, that's too big. Hey. Let's go. Winner, winner. But it feels good. All this quality time. It's really important to have my friends and my family around me because I'm not at the gym all day. I'm not thinking about. What's next? I gotta relax. I have to do something outside of the box. Yeah, come on, AJ. We gotta eat, man. I've been waiting for all this week to eat these fish tacos. And Monday comes, we're back on track, we're back on the mission until it's completed. It's been nearly two years since his life changing night with Anthony Joshua. In June of 2019, Joshua was originally scheduled to defend his heavyweight belts against Jarrell Big Baby Miller. When Miller failed a pre-fight drug test, he was out and Ruiz was in, with a little help from social media. 
The whole thing started on Instagram. Once the fight was canceled, that's when I messaged Eddie Hearns on Instagram and I told him, hey Eddie, give me the opportunity, I'm ready. I just got done fighting, I won, I'm prepared, I'm ready, give me the opportunity. And what do you know, when he messaged me back, ah, we're all jumping and we're all super happy because I thought he was gonna give me the opportunity right away. He said that he wanted to meet up and that's when my promoters and, and all that met up and you know what, they made the fight happen. Tiempo. June of 2019 in Madison Square Garden, and it's Anthony Joshua defending his three title belts. Anthony Joshua was the man at that point, considered to be number one heavyweight in the world. He was undefeated. He was the man to beat at that time. Welcome the challenger, Andy. Andy looked happy. He, he was happy to be there, and, and you could tell he had a big smile on his face walking towards the ring. Joshua was a king, right? Everybody thought that there's no one that could beat him, and especially me, right? Once they see me and then seeing Joshua, they're like, man, what the heck? I don't think this chubby kid's gonna beat him until, boom, they met Andy Ruiz Jr. And here we go, round number one, heavyweight championship of the world. In the first round, I was giving Ruiz proper credit for boxing well, for being defensively responsible, being uh, pretty much up to the moment. You could already start noticing little things there. One, uh, the speed difference. You know, Andy's hand speed is tremendous when compared to any heavyweight. That's what Reed does well. He counters. He has fast hands. For a big guy, he has really fast counters. He was in shape. He was in training. He was prepared. And, and Joshua didn't expect that at all. He didn't. He thought that, look at this fat guy, this out of shape guy. I'm going to handle this guy easy, walk through it. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen all the time. Fox. Round number three. The third round of the first Joshua versus Ruiz fight is one of the greatest rounds in boxing history, let alone heavyweight boxing history. Anyone with fast hands in boxing can be dangerous. The third round started the way that you would expect it to go. Anthony Joshua lands an uppercut, lands a left hook, down goes Ruiz. Good uppercut and a hook, puts Ruiz down. Wow, that was fast from Joshua. I think the first knockdown was kind of expected. As we're calling it ringside, we're anticipating the heavyweight champion finishing this guy off and making it a grand night. I think I got a little lazy uh, next to him, and that's when he got me with the upper and the hook, and he dropped me. I've never been dropped in my whole life until that, that day, but it just happened so fast. It's like a blink of an eye. Boom, I'm on the floor. Everybody knew that that was gonna happen, but they did not know that I was gonna come back. You know, I kept my composure. I even took a deep breath, and I was just like, wow, this is game time, you know? And he got back up, and even the commentator <laughs> knew that it was over. We all knew. Anthony Joshua is a composed and ferocious finisher. Watch this. We figured Anthony Joshua would just run over there and finish the job, and that's exactly what he attempted to do. He hit me with the flush right hand, I ate the punch, I kept moving, I was still in the game, and what do you know, I hit him with the hook in the temple. Ruiz comes to fire back, and Joshua's hurt! Oh, Joshua goes down! Within a matter of seconds, Ruiz went from being knocked down to knocking down Joshua. You know, when you lose some real estate in, in the ring and you're fighting and the guy backs you up, you got to get that real estate back, and that's what he did. What an answer by Ruiz! When I dropped them, that's when I was like, wow, I'm back in the game. You could visibly see Anthony Joshua's equilibrium was off. He was hurt, and he actually never came back from that punch. Joshua on unsteady legs. And to Andy Ruiz's credit, he did not let his foot off the gas. Andy Ruiz swarmed Anthony Joshua. Combination punching, punches from different angles. He swarmed Anthony Joshua. This was an accumulation, and that accumulation sent Joshua to the canvas a second time in that round three. Joshua is hurt, he staggered, and he goes down again. Joshua's wow. been down twice. That second knockdown in round three proved that that first one wasn't a fluke. This was Andy Ruiz imposing his will on Anthony Joshua. And the bell ah. saved Anthony Joshua. Somehow Joshua gets his legs with him to make it to the end of the round. We got high drama at Madison Square Garden. And we're back underway here, and Ruiz is out firing and trying to become the heavyweight champion of the world in a stutter. 
So I think the next couple of rounds that followed, you really wanted to see a response from Anthony Joshua and you wanted to see him just maybe take a second, take some time in the ring, regain his composure, keep Andy Ruiz at a distance, begin to feel comfortable in there again. And, and that never really seemed to happen. We've seen Anthony Joshua get knocked down and come back. He did that against Vladimir Klitschko. So we thought there's a chance that Joshua could regain his composure after a few rounds and come back in this fight. Well, Andy Ruiz didn't let that happen. Round seven was just an incredible round. It, round seven was something that I never expected to see. His legs were gone. My confidence was super up. I felt really good. I felt amazing. I felt like, wow, this is my chance. This is my, my, my time to shine. Joshua just could not deal with the speed of uh, Andy Ruiz. He didn't know where these punches were coming from, and they were hard punches. And yeah, Andy's the smaller guy, but he, he can crack. And that's what was making the fight go in Andy Ruiz's favor. And then all of a sudden, the third knockdown happened. And now a barrage, the champ's in trouble, and down to go! Down goes Anthony Joshua for the third time. And now this was the territory where Ruiz could really taste that heavyweight championship. Off the rope. Rock. Andrew Ruiz, another onslaught, and more combinations, more of those fast hands that you heard about when he was rising the ranks. He knocks down Anthony Joshua again. Joshua with the hard jab. Trying to answer, but he's shaking, he's down again. Wow, Joshua looks gassed. Four. Mouthpiece came flying out of his mouth. Joshua is stumbling all over the place. He finally makes it to his feet, and the referee takes one look at him. He turns his back to Anthony Joshua for a second. He goes to his corner, not showing a competitive body language. He was laying on the ropes, both hands stretched across the ropes. And I remember him glancing over, I believe it was at his corner, to give them a signal like, it's all right, I got this. But he didn't look like he had it. I even looked at the at my my corner man like man what's going on? Ready to box? Joshua looks so tired. I think oh, he, he wants out. out. That's it. Andy Ruiz is the heavyweight champion. Once he waved it, it was like the best time of my life. I was like jumping like a little kid. Loves cake. It was it was crazy. And Andy Ruiz becomes the first Mexican American heavyweight champion. It was exhilarating to be calling it, witnessing something that was so surprising and, and so great at the same time. This was everything that Andy Ruiz was building towards since age six. This meant everything to him. And he had just shocked the world, an 11 to one underdog. Andy Ruiz has shocked the world. If you're a boxing fan and you really love boxing, that, that brings a, a big smile to your face because you're, you're seeing a dream come to reality right before your eyes. Ruiz's victory was simply the shocker of the century. It was the biggest heavyweight upset since Mike Tyson lost to Buster Douglas. Andrew Ruiz had his one shining moment as well. The new heavyweight champion of the world, Andy. This is my apartment since December in downtown LA. Beautiful view. I really, 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 really love this view. It never gets old. You always find something new. High above the Los Angeles skyline is where Chris Areola calls home. The 40-year-old Areola realizes the importance of his clash with Ruiz. And even here at home, the preparation continues for May 1st. I've had a couple strength and conditioning coach. They do a great job, but I don't feel like I need it. I know my body and I know what I need to do. I hold myself accountable. If a pay-per-view fight doesn't motivate you, then you're probably in the wrong sport. There's constant work, even while I'm at home, because I know he's working. I don't know how hard he's working, but I'm working. I love boxing. I don't understand why people just give up on their dreams. I don't get it. If you believe in yourself so much, just keep, keep at it. For 18 years, Ariola has been one of boxing's most entertaining fighters in a career filled with many highlights along the way.
It's September of 2013. Areola now gets a chance at Seth Mayhem Mitchell. This was a different role for Chris Areola. He was no longer the young undefeated kid. Now Chris Areola was a veteran. He was 34 and three coming into this fight. And Chris Areola brought that experience edge to the fight against Seth Mitchell. He was an ex-football player. He played at the University of Michigan. And he was an up and coming and he was rising fast, like very fast. You know, he was, he was the it guy in the heavyweight division at the time that I fought him. And I remember telling him that he better wear his helmet in the fight. There's no timeouts in boxing fight. You get hit, there's no, hey, coach, come in, sub me out. No, no, you're gonna get hit, you're gonna get hit again and again. I hit him with a simple double jab right hand. And then when I hit him with the right hand, his eyes just went whoop. He's like, oh, shit. oh man, I want out of here. So I just, obliged him and took him up. Well, you know, a football player is a football player. And I just tell my football friends, pros, they wanted to box me. I said, I can't go on the football field with you. How are you gonna get in the ring with me and be able to stay with me? So, I mean, that's what he did. He fought a football player. He was strong, but he didn't have the skills to stay away from that. So that was a great win for him. July 2016, we're in Birmingham, Alabama, the home of the WBC champion, Deontay Wilder. But for Chris Ariola, it's another shot. It's another opportunity. Deontay Wilder was undefeated. Wilder had knocked out all but one opponent. Basically, someone who was like Thor. One punch with the right hand, and it was lights out. You ready? Wilder can't wait to get started. The first few rounds, we saw what makes Chris Chris. Chris is gonna come forward and he's gonna throw punches or attempt to throw punches and really pressure you. But you know, he ate a lot of punches against Wilder, and he's a guy that you do not want to eat a lot of punches with. Deontay Wilder was working really nicely behind the jab, keeping him at a distance, but it, Chris Ariola just kept on coming in waves, trying to find a way in, but, but really couldn't make anything happen in that fight against Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder is doing his thing, landing bombs, and boom, down goes Chris Ariola. Oh. Hard right hand, and down goes Ariola. The fourth round, he caught me with a uppercut, with a flash uppercut, and I don't even know how I ended up in the ground. I guess it was the, the he hit me that hard. Just that guy caught and just had to survive that round. Deontay Wilder had one punch knockout power. That just shows the strength of Chris Ariola to stay on his feet and to not get knocked out but he got brutalized in that fight, and his face showed it. Chris Ariola's face now all busted up. But, you know, he never quit. Uh, that's the one thing with Chris Ariola throughout his entire career. He never quit. Ultimately, the fight would be stopped by his corner in the eighth round, so it will go down as a knockout for Deontay Wilder, but Chris Ariola is one of the few men that Deontay Wilder didn't actually physically knock out in the ring. I didn't think about retirement. I love what I do, and I'm still not done, and I'm st I still believe that I, that I was able to be a, a heavyweight champion. With his May 1st matchup with Chris Ariola looming, Andy Ruiz Jr. has a newfound dedication to his sport. If you don't have happiness inside yourself, I feel the money, the cars, the material stuff doesn't mean anything. I wake up at seven in the morning. I take a nice little poop in my bathroom. I relax. I look on my phone, see the messages, tell my kids I love them, my girlfriend, and you know, it's game time. Ruiz has a structure in his life now that he lacked earlier in his career. A structure that was non-existent after he shocked the boxing world in 2019 to become the new heavyweight champion. After what I, when I won on June 1st against Anthony Joshua when I became the first Mexican heavyweight champion of the world, my life changed a lot, not just for me, but for my parents, for my loved ones, my kids, and it was just amazing. I was living in my mom's room at that time with my girlfriend and my kids. In her room, I got to hear her snore. It was embarrassing, but you know what? It's just the, the struggle of life, so I had no way but to make it out of there. That's the beauty of boxing. One punch can change anything. One punch 
you're the heavyweight champion. You wake up the next day, you're an overnight celebrity. Your social media numbers are, are going through the roof. Uh, everyone wants a piece of you. And that kind of got to Andy Ruiz. It has been lessons learned in and out of the ring that have revamped Ruiz's outlook on his career. Perhaps the most important ones came from his December 2019 rematch with former champion Anthony Joshua. So they were slated to fight again, and that fight was six months away. But during that six months, there was trouble in paradise. It was kind of overwhelming. There were, I, I don't want to blame it on nobody else besides me, but I was being dragged to the parties. I was going to the clubs, not doing what I was supposed to do. He started to put on a lot of weight. We started hearing a lot of rumors that he was no longer training. He was no longer talking to his trainer. Uh, he didn't want anything to do with boxing. And then, you know, he caught up. The boogeyman came back and, you know, caught up with him. He didn't get ready and he wasn't in shape. And he made it, in my opinion, uh, you know, he failed. The rematch between Andy Ruiz and Anthony Joshua took place in December of 2019 in Saudi Arabia. Anthony Joshua locked himself in the fortress of solitude and decided to dedicate himself to getting better. And unfortunately, the opposite was true for Andy Ruiz. So I think for the first fight, we thought that Anthony Joshua was perhaps overlooking Andy Ruiz somewhat. Then you spin forward six months later to the, to the second fight, to the rematch, and I think by the time it came to fight, there was a lot of concern that Andy Ruiz's head wasn't where it was supposed to be. Yeah, Andy Ruiz in the first fight was in great shape. He came in at 268 pounds. Uh, in the rematch, he gained 20 pounds. You know, that, that shows you the difference uh, of what a unfocused training camp can do to you. And I heard 283, and I thought, it's not possible. I mean, it's not possible. And once it sunk in, I thought, this is over. He's not gonna win this fight. I was almost weighing like at 300 pounds fighting against Anthony Joshua. Of course, I had doubts in my, in my head saying like, man, I'm going in there not prepared. I know I didn't do this, I know I didn't do that. But it was too late. Here we go, round number one. You can see the extra weight on Andrew Ruiz. He is nearly 16 pounds heavier than he was back in New York City. Well, right off the bat in the first round, we saw what Anthony Joshua was going to do. And that was keep his distance, use the jab, a very stiff jab at that. And he cut Andy Reese over the left eye in the first round. Oh, he's that's, that's cut him as well. There's blood now, and that looks like it's on the eyelid. And he wasn't letting Andy Reese get his punches off. And I think it showed in the frustration for Andy Ruiz going forward in that fight. If you take a look at Andy Ruiz, you can see the weight. It was just, it was hard to miss. The fact that he was just not in shape for, for this fight. I couldn't really move. I couldn't cut the corners. I couldn't cut the ring. I couldn't throw a lot of punches. It was just, it was horrible. So the whole fight looked the same. Anthony Joshua was just sticking and moving. Outpointing Andy Ruiz every round, keeping him at a safe distance. Only certain times they would mix it up, he'd go right back to the outside and keep him away. After the bell in the seventh round, Andy Reese throws a left hook. It didn't connect, because had it connected, God knows what would have happened. You know, maybe we would have had a disqualification or something. But you could tell, you know, it was frustration on Andy Reese's part. I was frustrated the whole fight on the rematch. My dad screaming at me, my, my coach is telling me one thing. Uh, you know, it was overwhelming. You know, if you're Manny Robles in the corner of Andy Ruiz, halfway through this fight, you've got to seriously consider some kind of tactical adjustment. This strategy simply isn't working. Round eight, you know Ruiz isn't going to quit. You know that. He's going to try to the belt. In round eight, you finally saw Andy let his hands go. Something that I'm sure his coaches and even fans watching uh, the fight were saying, Andy, let your hands go. Come on, you know, that, that's your, your biggest weapon, your best chance. You got to swarm Joshua with your fast combination punching. And he's able to do that, and he had his best round. And that's a hard right hand off the hook by Ruiz. Here's Ruiz, big chance. He swats him with the right hand as well. You know, round eight, if he would have fought the way he fought in that round from the beginning, 
You know, it could be a very different picture right now. Andy Ruiz could be the one heading into a fight uh, with Tyson Fury uh, to be undisputed heavyweight champion. See two things that Andy Ruiz is doing different this round. He's forgetting about the head. He's throwing the right hand to the body. It's a great strategy. This is the best round for Ruiz. But that was the best round uh, that he had. Uh, you know, Joshua uh, was able to make it out of that round, but Joshua played it safe. He weathered the storm. He learned from his experience. And uh, in that ninth round and onwards, he just stuck to the game plan. with a resounding answer, as if to say, how did you like that? Bring those belts back to me. In the 12th round, when it was over, I knew that I lost the fight. I knew that I lost the war, and I was angry, but at myself only because I knew the things that I should have did, and the stuff that I that I could have done, I did not do. So I was, I was really sad at that. He didn't take this camp seriously. He didn't throw it on his trainer. He took all the blame himself. And he said he wasn't listening to his trainer, but he knew he needed to do something different. It was Manny Robles that got you to the championship. It was Manny Robles that you won the championship with, but he decided he needed a change. That change was linking up with trainer Eddie Reynoso. Ruiz has embraced the gym's no-nonsense approach in his quest to once again rise to the top of the heavyweight division. He is learning and he is seeing how he works, how is the discipline in this gym, and I think that it has served a lot to Andy to motivate him. Here they don't play around. It's discipline, work hard, or if not, then you just gotta leave and move on. Thankful to God that they opened the doors for me to be here. It's been amazing getting in shape. Eso abajo y arriba, mijo. Fum, fum. Es uno, dos, tres, fum. No, así, fum. Abajo y arriba, para que trabaje más la cintura. Ahí, muy bien. Lo que le estaba faltando, creo que en las últimas peleas, un poco más de movilidad, un poco más de movimiento de cintura, las piernas, y sobre todo también en que baje un poquito de peso para que se pueda mover mejor en el ring. I was at 310 pounds. I'm like at 257 right now. Now I'm moving like an elbow, you know? Tres, cuatro, cinco, uno, dos, cuatro. Sin duda tiene muchísimas cualidades. Muchísimo talento y más que creo que el camino lo conoce. Ahora es cuestión de que él siga trabajando de esta manera para llegar al campeonato. Cuatro, uh, cinco. My mentality is different. I'm more disciplined. I'm more focused. The most important thing is I know what I want and I know what I need to accomplish. In the first fight, I got down, I got back up. And that's exactly what I did after my last defeat. I got down, I got up, and now we're heading on the right track. Chris the Nightmare Ariola has been training with Joe Goosen, long considered one of boxing's best trainers since 2019. Oh, yeah, so we're, we're playing the inside game. That's yeah, yeah. It. Okay. It's a pairing that has rejuvenated his career. You know, I've known Joe since, God, my seventh, eighth fight. Joe was a breath of fresh air. One line I thought about Chris Ariola, and that's game player. He is a game player. That's probably my best compliment I can give to a fighter. We joke around here and there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> whether we're joking, whether we're talking crap to each other, whatever it is, it's always work. It's constant work. Yeah, 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 okay, get to work. You know, that's, that's the way it goes. Chris has just been very attentive to doing all the little stuff that adds up. Right now, he's working very hard. Everything I'm asking him to do, he's doing. Last one, Chris. Yes, sir. Win, lose, or draw, Chris Ariola has never stopped trying to get to the top of the heavyweight division. In 2019, his battles with Jean-Pierre Augustine and Adam Kovnowski showed that even at age 38, he was a force to be reckoned with.
The fight against Jean-Pierre Augustine was at AT&T Stadium in Dallas. And Chris Ariola is in the latter stages of his career. To be honest with you, against John Augustine, I don't know if I was brought up as an opponent, but he was undefeated. I never thought of myself as an opponent. But this is ultimately a fight that Chris Ariola showed that he was a, a new version of himself. There is Augustine who is looking to remain undefeated. Chris just took it right to him, was vicious in his punching, just, he touched him everywhere and uh, stopped him right away. One of the things that I noticed about him that even my jabs hurt him, so it was very easy for me to move him around. He swarmed Augustine, he landed combinations, he landed the one-two, and eventually the referee had to stop this fight, giving Augustine his first loss. John Pierre fight was great for my career because it just proved that I'm still a heavyweight to be reckoned with. The nightmare! August of 2019. Chris Ariola looked so good against John Pierre Augustine that he got the opportunity to face a young undefeated star in Adam Kovnaski. I've been to Barclays Center for an Adam Kovnaski fight. It is loud and it is full of his fans. The atmosphere was off the charts at Barclays this night, a night where rock'em sock'em robots came to life. Chris Ariola came into this fight at what he calls the best shape of his life, and it certainly looked like that. All right, fans, here we go. And Kovnaski comes right at Ariola early. From the very beginning of the fight, these guys start throwing lots of punches. I was there counting those punches. The duo combined to land 667 punches, a heavyweight record. The duo combined to throw 2,172 punches, shattering the record by over 400 punches. Truly a special night at the Barclays Center. This is a slugfest. Yes, sir. We set a record of most punches thrown by a heavyweight that night. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know how many punches I threw. It says here you threw 1,125 punches, is that right? 1,125 punches. If that's what you, they said I, I threw, then I guess I threw all those punches. I wasn't counting them, I was just throwing them. Both these guys are going at it, right? They're trying to get that title fight, baby. Kovnatsky and Ariola go the distance in Brooklyn. And even though Adam Kovnatsky won this fight by a unanimous decision, it was like Chris Ariola won the night. And this performance by Chris Ariola, even though he came up short, kept him right in the conversation for top matchups in the heavyweight division. I still keep working to strive to be a better me. But every fight I feel like I'm getting better and better and better. And I'm 40 years old and I think that I'm finally getting there. I expect a brawl for as long as it lasts because I don't think this one's going the distance. No way. It's really important for me to get this victory because I want to prove people wrong, you know? I wasn't just a one-hit wonder. May 1st on pay-per-view is going to be entertaining. It's going to be non-stop rock'em sock'em Mexican fighters giving their all to win a fight. He don't give up, I don't give up. We're both Mexican warriors. We're not scared of getting hit, and I think it's gonna be an all-action fight. All the pressure is on him. I have no pressure. I just gotta go in there and fight. I know what I could do, and I know we're gonna get this victory in May 1st. <laughs>